Jason Kim, for joining us. Um, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to be here with you today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Adele Costa. I'm the head of school here at the School of Mathematics and Statistics at UNSW. And uh, we have some fabulous colleagues presenting um, tonight. Uh, the first person we have on this International Day of Mathematics was standing before us. But before I start, I'd like to welcome you all here and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the custodians of the land in which we stand, the Beautiful people, and uh, pay the, my respects to um, their elders. So, uh, we have a taste tonight applied mathematics in a couple of different forms. Mathematics and statistics is a spectrum. It is continuous across a whole range of really fabulous things where you can get quantitative insight into all sorts of structures, be they in the real world or abstract and purely in terms of intellectual pursuit. So tonight we're going to see something from the very applied end of the spectrum looking at definitely a real world system in terms of uh, movement of water in the oceans. And we're also going to look at applications on an applied mathematics area, which is fundamental to actually underpin a whole lot of real world applications, but in and of itself can be highly theoretical. So for our first uh, vignette, I would like to introduce Michael Dennis who is an applied mathematician who's interested in dynamical systems. And as you can see, particularly in physical oceanography and also geophysical fluorocarbonic systems, so large scale systems. Uh, he hopefully will give us a lovely talk. He is a former awardee of the ANZIAN, which is Australian and New Zealand uh, uh, Applied Mathematical Society, um, award for best student presentation last year. So, uh, without further ado, I will let Dennis take over. Uh, sorry, Michael Dennis take over. I'm getting ahead of myself, and he's going to tell us all about ocean waves and mesoscale and dynamics. I will be talking again afterwards. We're going to have a mixer at the conclusion of the two talks, and I'll invite you downstairs. It's directly below us, and that's when we can have time to ask questions and so on. So we're going to segue between the two talks and then have discussion at the end. So. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk at all about ocean waves except for two little points in the talk. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about eddies. Um, but when I was asked to give a talk today uh, for International Day of Mass, I didn't really know what to talk about. Uh, I could spend 30 minutes talking about ocean dynamics and and really uh, focusing on you oceanographers at the back that I see here. Um, and I'd get a lot of insight out of it, but I'm, I'm, it'd be quite abstract for a lot of people. And so I thought what I'd do today is um, give you a bit of a, a tour of my journey through maths, my approach to maths, and then just give you a little slice of um, what my research looks like. Um, so I'm, I'm an applied mathematician. I take um, mathematics as a toolkit and I apply it to problems. And I'm particularly interested in uh, ocean dynamics problems. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk a bit about my journey. Um, so I'm a recent PhD graduate. Uh, for those in the room that don't know too much about PhDs, uh, that means I've spent the last three to four years doing some research. Uh, I put all of that together into a document that I then get sent off and some people examine it. They either say, wow, that's great, you get a PhD, uh, or not good enough, you need to do a bit more. Uh, fortunately for me, they said, wow, that's great, you get a PhD, uh, and so I can call myself a PhD graduate. Um, but in in the last few months, I've, I've done a lot of reflection about my journey to where I am now, because I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I have to find a job, I guess. Uh, and I've thought about what, what have I, you know, sort of achieved in the last... Uh, four years, but sort of throughout my life. And I think about my journey as a sequence of sort of forks in the road. And the very first fork that I can remember was when I was at, in junior school in year four, all the way back in 2004. Um, 
I grew up overseas. I was born in Australia. We moved uh, to Belgium when I was young. Then we moved to America. And then we came back to Australia in year four. And um, I'd never really, um, you know, seen the ocean or anything while I, I lived overseas. Uh, so the ocean wasn't this sort of thing that I wanted to study ever since I was a young age. But I loved problem solving. So my first uh, sort of fork in the road was, in, was when I was in year four. Uh, I remember joining my new school, not knowing anyone. No one knew who I was. No one knew my interests, my abilities. And uh, the very first maths class, uh, four or five students got up, left the room early. And I thought, where are they going? Why do they get to, to bludge? Uh, why do I have to do work? So I raised my hand, asked my teacher, you know, where, where are these students going? And she said, oh, they're the gifted students. They're the, you know, the uh, ones that are really good at maths. And so they're going to go to the honours class in maths. And I thought, well, why don't I get to go to that? <laughs> and she said, well, you haven't shown that you're gifted. Um, and so then that was a Tuesday, I think. And then the Wednesday I was in the honours class and all was good. Um, but that was my sort of first walk in the road of um, mathematics on one side. And maybe had I not gone into that honours class, uh, I wouldn't have pursued mathematics to where I am now. But that's not to say that you have to be in the top class to, to pursue mathematics. In fact, uh, one of my close friends uh, didn't do mathematics at school. He fell in love with it at, at university. And now he's actually uh, an assistant professor at UCLA doing maths. So you don't have to do maths uh, from a young age to be a mathematician. So that was my first fork. The second fork was the very next year. Um, I had this teacher, Mr. McDonald. He liked to play pranks on us. And he had said to us uh, early on in the year that ocean waves in Sydney come from the ocean and they move towards the shore. So in Perth, they must go from the shore and move out towards the ocean. And I was like, oh, wow. That is really cool. Um, wow. And I just accepted it as fact. He was an authority. Um, and I actually went to Perth at the end of that year for a hockey tournament, and we went to the beach, and the waves did not go from the shore. <laughs> um, and that was the first moment I realised that someone can make a statement about something, and you can take it as fact, but really you can prove that it's true or not. And that sort of sparked my curiosity. Um, maybe it's not exactly a maths thing, maybe it's more of a science thing, um, but that's when I started to question sort of everything that I was told. I really wanted to know why things work, why things happened, what are the processes? Um, and then from year five, so that's a long time ago now, um, to, to university, there were a bunch of different walks that, you know, showed up on my path. Um, I remember in year eight, I had this fantastic teacher, Dr. Peter Kudis, who's actually a former PhD graduate here at UNSW in the early 2000s, if anyone remembers Peter Kudis. He did oceanography. I didn't know that until much later on. Uh, but he was the sort of first person to show um, excitement about my interest in maths. Um, and he sort of acted as a mentor to me uh, from years eight until uh, I finished high school. Uh, but one of the interesting things that happened towards the end of high school when I started to think about what am I going to do once I finish school is, uh, oh, I wanted to go to university, but I didn't know what to study. And so I spoke to the careers counsellor at the time, uh, Miss Marnie, and she said, well, if you're interested in maths, why don't you do actuarial science? Why don't, you, why don't you become an actuary? She didn't know that mathematics was a research part. She was the careers counsellor, so I'm sort of putting her on blast right now. But, um, yeah, she, she said, why don't you become an actuary? And uh, Dr. Cutis pulled me aside and he said, no, no can study maths it's a it's an option uh, and it's a good option um and so i i went to university um my undergrad uh maybe i shouldn't say i went to UCID rather than unsw uh and the reason was that it was one train rather than a train and a bus at the time <laughs> um but i i went to to sydney uni where i studied maths and computer science um and I remember early on thinking maybe maths isn't for me. Uh, we had really early lectures at the time. Um, the, the content was very abstract. I couldn't really get a sense of where the problem solving could be. 
Um, and I started to, to direct myself down the computer science route. I thought maybe I'll become a software engineer. We're programming every day, solving really cool problems. Maybe that's what I'll do. Um, and I kept maths as my other major on the side because I thought, well, it looks good on my resume, so why not? Um, but then in my third year, I took a course in differential equations and dynamical systems. Uh, it was a course by a guy called Robbie Marangel, great American mathematician at, at Sydney Uni, and it got me so excited. Um, I thought at that point, that was my sort of turning point, maths is what I'm going to do, I'm going to pursue maths. So that was in my third year. And then after you finish three years, you can choose to do uh, an honours year, which is a little bit of research and coursework. And I spoke to Robbie and I said, I want to do you know, a project. What, what should I do? He didn't have any projects that year, uh, but there was a cool project on uh, bee population uh, dynamics. And then there was a project in financial maths. Uh, I really wanted the bee project, uh, but my friend Jono got the bee project. So I ended up doing financial maths, um, which... Uh, is, is fantastic, uh, a great research area, but I found pretty quickly it wasn't for me, but I really love the research side of things. So I, I put a little fork there at the University of Research and Industry. It's not really a fork because you can go to one and then end up in the other, you can go to the other, end up in the other, so forth. Uh, but at that point, I decided I'd take some time off um, and, and work in industry for a little bit. But in my honours year, I, I did a course in fluid dynamics. Uh, by another great American mathematician, uh, Jeff Basil, who is, um, for those who know him, he's quite an eccentric guy, uh, very passionate. And it, the, the study of fluid dynamics blew my mind. I thought this is the coolest thing ever after that third year course. So I decided that I'd work in industry and then find a project that I was really interested in and passionate about um, in terms of fluid dynamics. So that's sort of my, my journey till I started my PhD uh, four and a half years ago. Now I'm done and uh, what's next? That's the question. Um, so that's my journey. What do I think about mathematics? Um, I had a slide in here before um, that was this uh, sort of pyramid where you think of mathematics as a building block and you build up to research. So you, you uh, get a really strong foundation to your pyramid, so your fundamental mathematics, then a bit more advanced and specialties and, and research. But then I saw some slides, uh, I think, early this week or late last week, and I thought, well, I'm just going to copy this guy's slides. They're really cool. <laughs> um, so I put a little link. Uh, it's this guy called Matt Might. But think of this circle uh, as all of the mathematical knowledge that we have in the world today. Everything that we know is inside this circle, and what we don't know is outside of it. When you go to school, you learn a little bit of maths. You get some foundational work. Uh, you know your uh, multiplication, uh, subtraction, uh, a little bit of calculus, that sort of stuff. Then you might decide, well, I'm going to go to university and learn a bit more mathematics. So you build on, on top of your mathematics and you get a bit more um, flavor of what's out there, you grow your knowledge base. Then you decide, well, I want to specialize in a particular part of mathematics, so maybe I'll do an honors degree and um, specialize. And so you, um, you, you learn a bit more in some coursework, but you, you start to take uh, a path of specialty. And that's that little bulge at the top right. So you, you learn a little bit more of what's out there. Then you might decide to do a master's, or maybe this is also part of your honours, where you start to really delve down that specific area. So for me, that's um, at the time, that was financial maths, but now it's more down the path of uh, oceanography. But you, you start to get closer and closer to the edge of what we know. There's still a lot that you, uh, that's out there that's, uh, that you don't know. You're starting to get to the edge. You enjoyed that so much, you loved it. So you decide I'm going to do a PhD. So you start your PhD. Um, you collect a whole bunch of uh, research papers. You talk to a whole lot of people. You go to conferences. Uh, you do workshops. You learn basically everything that there is in the field, um, all the way up to the edge of human knowledge. So if you look at where you are and you zoom in, 
you are at the edge of what we know, right? You know everything that there is in the field. You're an expert in just this uh, tiny sliver all the way to the edge. Then you start doing some research. You start asking some questions that have never been asked before. Uh, and you learn something. You learn something that's novel, unique, and no one's ever learned before. You've pushed the edge of human knowledge. You've added to our, our sort of uh, understanding of mathematics. And that little bit there is what I've just finished. It's called a PhD. <laughs> so all that you've done in the grand scheme of things is... In the grand scheme of things, just this little tiny sliver, but that's a legacy. That's something that we didn't know before, that we know now, all because you've spent, in my case, four years and three months and some number of days and hours. And um, But it's a legacy, and that that is going to persist for um, eternity, I guess. Uh, we'll see how long you know, civilization lasts. Um, but that's the contribution. Now, to take things uh, to another step, this is a slightly different circle. Now, one of the big misconceptions in maths is that it's this um, lonely, lonesome, you sit in a, in a desk and work away for years and you don't have much interaction with other people sort of uh, endeavour. Um, but I want to tell you that that's not the case at all. In fact, I think it's probably one of the most collaborative um, sort of pursuits that you can have. Uh, so think about this as you and your mathematical knowledge. So everything you know fits in this circle. And then you have a whole bunch of friends, family, colleagues, peers, uh, that have their own circles. They might be different colours because they study different things, different interests. They might be squares even. Um, but you can learn so much from those people. Uh, in fact, I don't think research today would be as productive as it is if we didn't talk to other people, if we didn't collaborate, if we didn't go to conferences, uh, if we didn't learn. Uh, and so if you think that when you study mathematics, particularly for the young people in the room, if you're going to pursue mathematics, that you're going to be alone doing it, not the case at all. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the few subjects, I think, that you actually you know, talk with a lot of people uh, every day. So that's my view of mathematics. Um, and I wanted to give you an analogy uh, that, that maybe if this didn't hit home, maybe the analogy will. So I thought, oh, well, what, what are some famous sports people? Um, we've got Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Wayne Gretzky, greatest star hockey player of all time, uh, Annemiek van Vleuten, the, um, I think, best cyclist of all time, and uh, Usain Bolt, fastest man on earth. So there's one thing that these people have in common. Uh, they all do different sports, but one thing that they have in common, um, one thing is that they're, I guess, two things that they have in common. Uh, they're a master of their craft, but to become a master in their craft, they had to spend thousands or tens of thousands of hours perfecting that craft. And I think of mathematics in the same way. If you don't put in um, the right amount of effort or regiment the, the effort in the correct way, you won't get to uh, solve really difficult problems. You'll get, you'll get stuck early on uh, doing, doing some small things. So if you think about Arnold, uh, he pushes you know, big weight, but he wouldn't be able to push big weight if he couldn't push smaller weight. So you have to build your way up to be the best. Um, the fastest man on earth, he built his way there. Um, cycling, I can tell you as a cyclist, he spent a lot of time cycling. Uh, and then I think Wayne Gretzky is just a natural talent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so if you didn't know, I love ice. Um, but, but one of the misconceptions also is that you have to be talented uh, from an early age to be a mathematician. Not the case at all. Um, you just really just need to build on those foundations and, and build it up from there. Um, okay. So on to my research. Uh, I said before that I do oceanographic research. Uh, oceanography is sort of the study of the oceans. So as a one, one slide, what do, we, what do we do in oceanography? We research, research the ocean. Um, but it's important because the ocean can be thought of as this sort of big, turbulent soup. Um, a lot of people have this idea that the ocean 
is sort of this stagnant pond. It's just water. But in fact, the ocean is incredibly, um, for lack of a better word, diverse. Um, parts of the ocean are incredibly salty and warm. Other parts are incredibly cold and fresh with no salt. Uh, parts of it are, are rich with nutrients or carbon. Um, other parts are rich with plastic. Um, and, and it's this sort of inhomogeneous distribution of, of material uh, that makes the ocean so interesting. Um, so what am I interested in? Um, the probably number one thing that you know about oceans is that they have ocean currents. And if you've watched Finding Nemo, you know about the East Australian current. Uh, but there are other current systems out there, like the Gulf Stream, Crucio Current. Um, and so the bottom right picture is a picture of the Gulf Stream. Um, but some of these other pictures, one is an ocean eddy in the ocean, but this is the atmosphere and this is Jupiter. So what do they all have in common? Um, they're all fluids. So the atmosphere is a fluid, uh, the oceans are a fluid, and they're all affected by rotation and stratification in the ocean or in the fluid. Um, but embedded within all of these huge systems are things that we call coherent structures. So uh, in the atmosphere, we can see von Kármán vortices, which form as uh, wind passes uh, an island. And so uh, it forms a standing meander and uh, these vortices form, which we can visualize in the clouds. In the ocean, we see ocean eddies, which are just these whirlpools. They can be tens of kilometers to hundreds of kilometers in diameter. Um, and they're one of the things that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, on Jupiter, there's this giant vortex called the Great Red Spot that has been observed at least for at least, you know, three, four hundred years. It, we don't know how long back it goes, but it's coherent. It's been there for a long time. Um, and then I, I think I spoke a little bit about um, currents, but currents are also coherent in the sense that they uh, exist, but they also um in a sense, maintain their coherency by acting as transport barriers to uh, different regions of the ocean. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so I'm interested in these things. The question is, how do you represent them? How do you identify them? How do you track them? We can see them when we, when we have clouds, but if there weren't any clouds in that area, those vortices would still exist. Um, in the top right, the eddy, that is a whirlpool of water that's moving, but if we didn't have um, plankton to see and visualize that, that uh, swirl, we wouldn't know it's there. So the question uh, that, that I focus a lot on is how do we identify these uh, coherent features? Also, how do we track them? But then lastly, how do they move stuff in the ocean? So they can trap uh, material, they can trap heat, they can trap salt, uh, and they can move it across the ocean. And that's what I'm particularly interested in. So um, one way that ocean eddies this is, uh, that's quite a traditional method, is to compute this thing called an Akubo vice parameter. Red shows regions of the ocean that are dominated by uh, rotational forces, and blue shows regions that are dominated by deformation or stretching forces. And so in this animation, we are showing uh, the South Atlantic Ocean, uh, where uh, that is Southern Africa. To the right of Southern Africa, the Agulhas current comes down. It meets the Antarctic circumpolar current, and it retroflects on itself. So it turns back, and it pinches off these rings of water, these rotating vortices, which are what we're visualizing as these red blobs that, that move across the ocean. Contained inside all of these red blobs is water from the Indian Ocean, which is very salty, very warm. And it's now inside the South Atlantic Ocean, which is much colder, much fresher, so less salt. These eddies form the um, one of the, the primary mechanisms for uh, heat and salt to make its way into the South Atlantic, which is really important uh, for climate processes. So one question would be, well, we can measure the size of these things. That's how much water's in them. And therefore, that's how much Indian Ocean water they transport. But if we actually seed, we zoom in, and we seed one of these 
red blobs with virtual particles. All we're doing is we're taking the water in there and we're colouring it black. And we let this thing move with the ocean flow. What we see is that a lot of the, the water that was in that red blob is spat out very quickly. Forms this um, filament and you can see all of this water is, is spat out. While other water, which isn't coloured, see through at the moment, uh, is entrained by the eddy. It's captured by it and, and the eddy moves it along. But there is also a little blob that stays with, with the eddy for a long time. So uh, one of my sort of contributions uh, to human knowledge, I guess, is on how um, these eddies transport material, whether it be, maybe if I zoom back, here we go. Um, I want to understand the contribution of that little inner core that exists and persists for a long time, but also how rings around the eddy might uh, transport material. So on my first project, that's what we did. I had a whole bunch of figures. Um, I'll come back to this. I had a whole bunch of figures, but I thought I'll just draw a schematic. The ocean eddy can be thought of as an inner core and these outer rings. And in my first project, we showed that the outer rings, so regions around the eddy, uh, perform the majority of the transport uh, by the eddy. So all that we're showing in the bottom is how much, on average, time does water stay within a given ring. And the, the blue and black rings, water stays in them for much, much longer than the inner core ring, that little red one. Uh, so that's one of my sort of contributions. Um, okay. That was for a single eddy. If we seed multiple eddies and colour their water, we can actually see that eddies um, don't transport material alone. They transport it in a group. So material from one eddy, think about that yellow one, might spit off material that's then captured by an eddy in front of it that, that transports that material. And then that is, again, picked up by the eddy in front of it. And it forms this sort of relay race of transport. Um, so this is something that we're working on at the moment. This is the only animation I have on it. Um, but this is this is a fundamental question. Rather than thinking of eddies as their own transport mechanism, we think of tra uh, trains of eddies as a transport mechanism. Now, one last thing that I've researched is on Southern Ocean flux. So I'll play this animation. It's not going to make sense straight away but I'll play it while I describe the Southern Ocean. So this is Antarctica. We've got South America to the top right is uh, South Africa and then our beautiful country of Australia and then New Zealand. Um, this, uh, the ocean in this region is called the Southern Ocean. It, it can be sort of um, described purely by the, the, what we call the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is this extremely fast flowing extremely deep current uh, that is circumpolar around Antarctica. It has no continental boundaries um, and it sort of uh, isolates Antarctic waters from uh, waters in other ocean basins like the, the Pacific, the Atlantic or the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, because that current is so fast flowing, it acts as a transport barrier to water. And so uh, what exists in um, in the ACC or the Antarctic Circumpolar Current is a series of fronts, which are interfaces between different water masses with different properties. Traditionally, we've used um, temperature as a way to identify these fronts. So on one side of the front, you would have warm water and another side of the front, you'd have colder water. Uh, you could define them by uh, the salinity. So one side's saltier, one side's not as salty. Uh, another way is by properties of the current itself, which you can measure from the sea level. So one side of the front is, is higher in sea level, uh, one side lower. Um, this is an exaggeration. It's really like tiny. Um, but those are the traditional ways. And we used a, a dynamical systems approach to define these fronts just by how the water moves alone, which are what those uh, three uh, different contours or lines are. Those three lines have nothing to do with the salt. 
on the top left, nothing to do with the temperature, nothing to do with the sea surface height. However, you can see, particularly in that, that temperature plot, um, the black line measures uh, one of those fronts quite well. Um, and so we've, we've sort of defined this new way of, um, of identifying ocean fronts purely from, from flow properties. Then we ask the question, well, how does material cross these fronts and where? Uh, so we made a plot. We, we looked at these fronts over years uh, and measured where material crosses the front. And what we found is this really staggering pattern of transport. Uh, what I originally thought would be um, pretty even transport northward and southward, what we found was that in particular regions, you'll have water preference moving from one ocean floor, from the north into the south or from the south into the north. So Antarctic waters moving northward or, say, South Pacific move, uh, waters moving southward. Um, that was interesting in on of itself. But then we asked the question, well, why and where? And what we found was that uh, the bathymetry of the ocean, so the topography of what's underneath the ocean, plays a, a very dominant role in where the transport occurs. So where you have... Um, Prominent seafloor obstacles like an undersea volcano or maybe a, a chain of islands, the Antarctic circumpolar current has to make its way around those features. Where it makes its way around those features and comes back, it starts to form this wave, this meander. And it's in that meander where uh, material is, is sort of transported from one side of the front to the other. Um, so I just sort of put that, that picture in because I think it's really nice, but I won't go into it. It's really nice though. So that's that's sort of my research. Um, and I guess the last few slides looked like I took this straight line. I had this problem that I wanted to solve. I showed you how I solved it and what the results were. But in fact, the path to getting to that final point, I was you know backtracking, I was going left, I was going right. I took a big squiggle. Uh, to get to where I was. My thesis, my PhD thesis, looks like a straight line, very coherent, very nice. But, but what we actually experience as mathematicians, which I think is a great thing, is you go down all these different paths and, and learn new things until you find um, the solution to the problem that you've been looking for. Um, so to sort of end it, I wanted to show you where my squiggle has taken me. Uh, which you might not think uh, doing mathematics, you, you get to go to all these cool places. Uh, but for an outreach trip, I got to go to the Parkes Telescope with uh, Yudi here, uh, which was awesome. We actually got to go up, not on the dish, but around the, the top of the base and, and have a look around. Uh, I went back to Perth. This is Rottnest Island. I saw that the waves did not go from the coast <laughs> and out. They, they came in. They, maybe the resolution doesn't show it. Uh, weirdly, I went to a women's rugby game at Harvard Uni. Um, I wouldn't have thought I'd see rugby over there, but I gave a talk at MIT and I got to see a rugby game, which was awesome. They said, oh, you're Australian. Come see a rugby game. <laughs> um, I went to New York. Uh, it's probably the most expensive place I've ever been to, but that was awesome. Uh, and then the last two pictures, I went to the Jet Propulsion Labs in um, Pasadena, California, where they build the satellites and the Mars rover, um, and I got to see a satellite being built, all because I, I do maths, uh, which is, I think, really, really cool. Um, and then my last, very last takeaway point, my last slide, um, and this is more focused for, for some of the PhD students at the moment, is you might think that everything that you're going to do for the next few years is research. But in fact, a lot of what you do, at least a lot of what I did, was writing and writing and writing about my research and sharing it to better understand it. Um, so yeah, think, think about the next few years. You're going to be doing a lot of, of um, learning how to, to share your ideas. Um, so with that, thank you.
Michael. Um, we might, just in the interest of time, keep the discussion and question until we mix at the end. Um, and just a reminder for those who entered late, uh, we will be having refreshments uh, directly below us one floor um, after the talks. Thank you. All right, so uh, I'm going to allow some changeover because we had a double edit tonight. Okay, we have had a lovely uh, journey through mathematical adventures and what a life in maths can be. And we're going to continue that journey, but with a different type of mathematics. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Francis Rowe. We actually started here in maths at the same time. We, we have um, parallel journeys, I won't say when. Um, <laughs> But I'll uh, say <laughs> <laughs> uh, But uh, Francis um, uh, was a postdoc and joined at the same time as I joined school as a lecturer. And um, it's a very nice thing we're going to talk about because in the last couple of years, we've heard a lot about exponential increases. All right. And most of the general public probably doesn't actually know what an exponential is. I'm hoping that some of us here tonight do know what an exponential is. But exponential increases uh, occur in all sorts of things. And sometimes it's worth noting that when you want to do things with lots of different pieces of information that influence the problem, the dimension of your problem goes up. And when you're trying to do computations on such systems, your computational time required has exponential increases with increases of dimensions. But Beyond that, I'm not really going to say because I'm not the one to say it. Frances is the expert. She is a computational mathematician, has won many awards and prizes, has had fellowships to fund her research. She's trained many students. She's an outstanding lecturer. And I think she will be the best one to talk about the curse of having lots of dimensions and how to lift it. So, as she's getting ready, I would like you to welcome Francis to give us her. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is being recorded, I think, and <laughs> someone is online, I hope. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, sorry, things were transitioning on. Well, this is. I will really point out also that Francis is the person who actually understands the how, most about how to how do this hybrid work. lectures and looks after all of us here in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of our teaching equipment and presentation <laughs> needs. <laughs> she likes. Oh, okay, yeah. so it is working, and I just need to get back here. All right, um, thank you very much, Adele. I heard a sort of half of that, trying to get it to work. Thank you, um, Michael, for making it so complicated for me to switch over, but I think we succeeded. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see all the different faces. Um, so this is a public lecture. I'm trying, I'm trying to make this talk not too technical. So let me start by, hi, right, Michael, Let's just tell you a bit about myself. So I'm Francis. I grew up in Taiwan. I did mathematics in high school, but that's just because that was part of the package deal. Okay, so in Taiwan, when you're in high school, you have the choice of either the science package with biology, which is what I took, or you can do science without biology, or you can do all the non-STEM stuff. And I didn't like, I didn't want to memorize history or geography, so I went for the science. That's, oh, so, so what you're gonna hear me say is, no, math isn't really my thing. It was just something I could do. All right, so in high school, I was not really interested in studying. I spent most of the time doing um, jazz, cheerleading, and I was in the marching band. There's me with my snare drum. This is why I have all the back problems these days, because I used to carry a huge drum around with high heels, but I'm pretty used to wearing high heels with heavy stuff. Um, so my family immigrated to New Zealand when I was noticing something that the camera is still tracking <laughs> Adele. Oh, no. no, sorry. It's actually still tracking um, it's still tracking Michael. Then <laughs> so no, okay, okay. I, I can do this. I can do this. Just give it to him. 
I can't do this in ten. That's <laughs> supposed to know how things work here. Okay, it's working now. It's tracking me. Thanks. Good. Okay, so where was I? Um. Uh. Where was I? Okay, so my family immigrated immigrated to New Zealand. It's my my father's midlife crisis, and somehow we decided to move elsewhere. So the whole family immigrated to New Zealand. It's a beautiful country. We, we were actually holidaying in Hamilton, drove past this beautiful house with a for sale sign outside. And then the owner sort of just said, would you like to come and have a look inside? And just like that, my father made an offer and we bought the place. So we moved to New Zealand. So I went, I didn't, fit, I finished high school in Taiwan, but I didn't actually take a university entrance exam. We, the whole family just moved. I escaped the HSC, which was not. But then, of course, I get to New Zealand. I couldn't go into university initially, so I ended up going to high school for one term. And after that, I ended up in university. So I did an undergrad in mathematics and computer science. Why did I do that? I just got to another country. I didn't really know any English. I couldn't do physics. I couldn't do, I mean, periodic table. I had to memorize everything again and biology, no way. So mathematics was the subject which I could do without knowing any English. And I mean, that's true. And then the computer science is the same thing. Programming language, you can do it without knowing English, right? So that's the honest truth. This is how I ended up in <laughs> um, math and computer science. But true, I really enjoyed the computer graphics. And when we finished, uh, when I finished the four year bachelor degree, I had a choice to actually go and work in this industry. But many of my friends went into working with uh, Weta, you know, the company that make the graphics movies for uh, Lord of the Rings. But then I thought, you get a scholarship for, do PhD, do, for doing PhD. And all my friends in Taiwan were still doing their masters. If I do a PhD, I would be the first person to get a PhD and compare with all my friends and all my family. So I thought, I'm going to do my PhD. And then afterwards, I'm, I'm going to go and work for Weta and make big money. So um, that's what happened. So I ended up doing PhD with Stephen. It's a picture of Stephen. He's a wonderful supervisor. I chose him because I know he's tough. He will make sure that I get through to the end because I was kind of lazy. Wasn't a very good PhD student. But anyhow, during my PhD studies, I had the opportunity to work with Professor Ian Sloan sitting right there. So Ian is my academic grandfather. So he was Stephen's student from Yes, uh, sorry, the other way around. Stephen was Ian's student from years ago. So I had the chance to work with Ian. I also had the chance to work with Professor Henry Wojnarowski from Warsaw. So they're both so supportive and so kind. I came to visit Ian. This was in the year 2001. So I was just a visitor then. So there's Ian, there's Henry, there's me. And I was actually scared to come by myself when Ian invited me. So what did my mom do? She says, I'll come with you. So there's my mom, and there's Ian taking me and, and Ian's wife, Jen, taking us for a nice picnic at Watson's Bay. So it was really, really nice. This is young Joseph back, back in the days. So I was visiting. I was in the office. So some of you here would know. So this is Joseph, this is Kasem, and this is Chi. So I shared the PhD office with them. When I was doing my PhD, I, I came to visit for a couple of weeks. And my first opportunity to attend an international conference was to go to an Oberwolf Art conference. This is somewhere in... Germany in the middle of nowhere where people get together and discuss. Right. So after that, Ian says, you finish your PhD. Why don't you come and do a postdoc? Oh, no, I want to work in the industry and make money. But he says, no, you might like it. So, <laughs> and then he says, here, you can come and work for me. There's a job waiting for you. Come and try. So I was lazy. I thought, OK, maybe I'll give it a go. I see. Maybe I might like it. So I ended up moving to Australia. And that was 2003. So this is 20 damn years ago. I was, I'm still here. So 20 years later, I'm still here. Am I sure that math is the right thing for me? Honest truth is no. I, <laughs> I struggle every day wondering why I'm doing this. Some days I really like it. Some days I just go, what would my life be like if I'm doing computer graphics? But anyway, so during this time, I started as a postdoctoral fellow. So this is for those of you who are young, this is something called postdoc, means something you do after you finish your PhD. So you continue to do research, you continue to learn from people around you, and you continue to make that little push, as Michael said, into this little corner of the unknown. And I had also some fellowship from the Australia Research Council. This is basically the government giving me some, some money to go, hey, do some more research. And I've been here since. Oh, and this is not me. This is my daughter. So I had my daughter in 2009. She's in year nine at the moment. 
And if you ask her, do you want to do math in the future? She's going to say, no. <laughs> Why? Because mommy, you're always working. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunately the, the truth. But what I do like about research is, it's like what Michael said, it's not, you don't work on your own. You work with a lot of people. I make lots of friends during this time. I enjoy working with people because there's always something that someone can teach you. And also people you work with tend to become long-term friends. So um, Ben Waterhouse, for example, some of you will know, he was one of the first PhD students that I co-supervised with Ian. He has now gone on to have his own company. And um, so Ian is here, Stephen, my former supervisor, of course, Rob, uh, William, and also Matt, some of you would know him as, know them as former staff member here. And this guy here in the corner, that's Dirk. So this is actually many years later now, he's my husband and he's <laughs> my there. Um, I think the camera has lost track of me again. <laughs> so, um, okay. Be fine. Okay, I better stand here then because I'm not tracking. All right, so continue to 2019. So I continue to work with more and more people from different parts of the world. People we work with continue to become, um, continue to work on new projects and so on. So there's some people here, some of you would know. So Alec, my former PhD student here, he's been away after his PhD, spent two years in Germany, being back with us, working as a postdoc. He came back with a lot of experiences. I'm learning things from him now. And this is how it works, is once you get part of your PhD, you become equal with everybody else that you work with and everybody just collaborate. Um, this is more recently. So I have Abby, my current PhD student here, and also Wei Wen, who is my PhD student in Belgium, and Lauren. So they are working from Belgium. Wei Wen was actually my master's student here a few years ago, right? Two yeah. years ago, but it was during COVID time, we mostly spent the time online. So anyway, that gives you a bit of background about me and all my friends. Many of them are in the room. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about my research. So I work on the area called quasi-multicolor methods. And I'm going to assume you know nothing about quasi-multicolor methods, okay? So we start right from the beginning. And I'm gonna assume most of you are high school students because that's what I was told. So you are all high school <laughs> students now, okay? So now we are going to compute the area under the curve. What's the area under the curve? We want to find out the size of that green bit. And in high school, you will learn this thing called numerical integration, which basically says you can approximate this with the sum of the rectangles. Okay, so that's the sum of those four rectangle areas give you an approximation to the green curve, or I mean to the green area underneath the curve. And understandably, if I use more rectangles, finer and finer subdivisions, you get better and better approximation. Okay, so that's the idea. But this is integration in one dimension, right? Now, if you want to do integration in two dimensions, we want to now imagine you have a surface, this beautiful curvy bluey thing, right? So this surface, and we want to compute the volume under the surface. Okay, so use the same idea as before. Instead of uh, rectangles, you can have rectangular prisms. So counting these chocolate bars. Now you want to add up the volume of these chocolate bars, and that will give you the approximation of the volume under the curvy bluey bit, okay? And so understandably, the more subdivision you have, the more rectangular prisms you have, the better the approximation we get, right? That's two-dimensional integration. Now, what about how do we generalize it to higher dimensions? I can't draw a picture in three dimensions anymore, but let's see what we can generalize. If you look at this graph from the top, so, so looking down at all those um, rectangular prisms, what you're going to see is basically a grid structure. And what you're doing is every time you compute the volume of each of these, you're basically taking the base area times the height, right? And because all the base areas are the same, you're basically taking an average of the value of the curve at those dots. So if you just look at the top part, you're basically adding up and taking the average of the function value at those green dots. The more dots you have, the more accurate the approximation is going to be. Okay, so instead of having eight times eight dots, instead of 64 dots, let's take k squared dot, maybe k could be, I don't know, a thousand. And that should be better approximation than before. 
Now, use this idea. Let's move to higher dimension. So suppose I have S dimensions. Imagine S is 100. OK, I can't draw you a picture anymore. You have to imagine this hyper, hyper um, surface. If I have k square dots in the unit square, then I would have k cube dots in the unit cube, k to the four dots in the whatever you call the four dimensional space, and so on. So if you have s dimensions, it would be k to the power of s points. And that can be a really, really large number. If k is just two, suppose you only have two points per direction, at 100 dimensions, it would have a huge number that's just impossible to do. Already, 2 to the 20 is 1 million. And that is effectively curse of dimensionality. That's what the phrase is, curse of dimensionality. When the dimensionality is high, you cannot do things the sort of obvious way. So how do we deal with this in a high dimensional sense? First thing to keep in mind is you have to stay away from this grid, grid type structure. Because if it's a grid, you just cannot go to the high dimensions. So this is what people with gambling do. It's not. But this is the method called Monte Carlo. OK, so the Monte Carlo method do it this way. So imagine now this is a high dimensional space, but this is just a two dimensional illustration. The Monte Carlo method would sample the function at randomly distributed points in the region, and it just takes the average. Basically, without worrying about what's the base area and so on, it just takes the average. Problem with Monte Carlo methods is that you would have large gaps, you would also have cluster of points. So the approximation is not going to be great. The convergence rate is low. So slow convergence means you need to have lots and lots of points to be able to get very good approximation. And we want to do better than this. Okay, so I work in the area called quasi Monte Carlo method. The word quasi means it's similar to, it's like. But in fact, it's nothing like Monte Carlo. Okay, it's the complete opposite of Monte Carlo. What we do is we choose the point deterministically so that they're actually better than random. So there are two family of quasi Monte Carlo methods. Uh, the first family I'll share with you is called digital nets. So it's all about subdividing the region into squares or rectangles and insist that you will have a certain number of points in every square. Okay, so, so in this picture of 64 points, I have exactly one point in each little square. And you see, I can also divide it this way. This is exactly one point in each rectangle. I'll come back to this, okay? So that's digital names. That's the first family of quasi Monte Carlo methods. Uh, the second family of quasi Monte Carlo methods, my favorite, lettuce rules. Okay, so it looks like a lettuce, <laughs> okay? So it's very regular. In fact, if you extend it, mathematicians will call this is the group structure. Basically, you add two letters points together, you get another letters point, and so on. And that's very nice because that makes analyzing them really easy. So I'll talk to you about that. So that's the two families of quasi Monte Carlo methods. Let me just go in a little bit more because I think some of you are looking really interested now. Okay, so digital net. This is like playing Sudoku. So let's now play Sudoku together, okay? So I have, we will, I want to give you an example of just a four point digital net. So this is a two dimensional grid. I want to place four points in this unit square so that there's exactly one point in each of the four rectangles. So if I divide this way, I want to have exactly one point in each. But if I divide it this way, I want to also have exactly one point in that direction. And if I divide it that way, I want to have also exactly one point in each. So all three conditions need to satisfy simultaneously. Okay, so let, let's see. So for example, let me start by putting a point here. So if I do that because of the condition, it means that this strip is, the rest of the strip is out, right? You cannot put any point there. The rest of the vertical strip is out. And also this corner is, is out. So if I want to place my next point, I have to avoid all the yellow bit. Okay, so let me say I put one here. And this would rule out this strip and this strip and this quarter. So the next point will have to go into any of the remaining white areas. So for example, if I put this here, then there, there's my fourth point. So let's just quickly check, okay? One point in each square, one point in each vertical strip, and one point in each horizontal strip. This is called a zero two two net is base two. All right, so what, what does that mean? Base two means, because I'm always subdividing by two, I always cut things in half. 
This two says I have two to the power of two, four points. This two says, no, this two says I have two dimensions. This two says I have two to the power of two points. This zero says I have two to the power of zero point in every subdivision. So ignore that detail. Let's try and extend this. Okay, so the idea is obviously you want to be able to do this in high dimension. Suppose we just want to do a T142 uh, net in base two. What that translates to is I want to subdivide this region such that whichever way I subdivide it, I want to have exactly two points in it. Okay, so we use this as one of the examples in one of the girls do the math workshops in the past. And initially I printed out this grid and said, we can let the girls go and do their drawing, try to play, put how many points? 16 points in here and see if they do a good job of distributing the points. And Alec and Michael Feischer, uh, a postdoc at the time, they, they went and made the booth and they thought, this is boring. Why would the girls want to be drawing this? So what they did was they printed out this thing on the giant sheet and brought some M&Ms and Skittles. And then the girls can come and just play with the Skittles on the table. And then when they finish, they get to eat the lollies. <laughs> so that somehow made it so much more interesting. So I'm sorry you don't have lollies today, but let's just have a look. So this is one possible solution I just randomly put in there. But you can see that when I subdivide this way, I have exactly two points in each. I subdivide that way, it's two points. Subdivide that way, two points. And that way is two points. Okay, so this is a TMS net. TMS, don't worry about what it means. This is a digital net. The idea of doing this in high dimensions is obviously not for you to go and draw dots or e schedules, right? It does not work. You can only do this in two dimensions, but we want a hundred dimensions. We want a thousand dimensions. And this is where mathematics come in. So we actually do this in the mathematical sense rather than in the picture drawing and eating all the sense. And it's a lot of fun. Let me now tell you about the other family of lattice rules, uh, the, the other family of um, um, Fossi Monte Carlo. This is my favorite one because it's easier than counting dots that way. This is called lattice rule because it looks like lattice. You can specify the points just by specifying one integer vector. So I'm sorry with a little bit of formula here, but this basically says to get the ith point, I need to take i over n times an integer vector. Okay, so all these points are all specified by this integer vector. And this fractional part means if I ever get a number bigger than one, I just leave out the integer of it. Okay, so uh, it means you can basically take it as modulo n and then divide by n. So my integer vector can be restricted to numbers from zero up to n minus one. This is a little bit technical for maybe for some of you, but all I wanted to say mainly is that the choice that you can make is limited, it's limited range, okay? There are finally many numbers you can choose from. But let's have a look at where this generating vector space, uh, this letters rule comes from. So this letters rule comes from using the generating vector 119. How does that work? The first point comes from putting in one over 64 times the vector 119. So that's one over 64 and 19 over 64. So if you look at the X, so one over 64, 19 over 64. So that's this point. Okay, and the second point comes from putting in I equals two. So you have two over 64, 38 over 64. And the third point comes from putting in I equals three. So it goes in there. And the fourth point would have come out here. But because of the fractional part or because of the modulus, you basically wrap it back in and it comes here. And you just continue like this. So all you need is one integer vector. This is an example of two dimensions. If I want a lattice rule in a thousand dimensions, all I need is 1000 integers. And that makes the whole construction much easier. All you need is imagine 1000 integers and every component of the integer is range restricted. Check the time, I'm obviously going over time a bit. So, all right. So. Let's now come back to the bigger picture. Okay, so we want to work out an approximation to an integral in high dimensions. So S is very high. How do we choose the points is one of the, the, the things. How do we get good quality points? And how should the error behave with N? This is about how, how quickly can we get to the approximate, approximated answer? And the, uh, the other part is about how the result depends uh, how the result depends on the dimension. If we go 
from a hundred dimensions up to a thousand dimensions to a million dimensions, how badly does the curse of dimensionality affect us? That's what we're interested in. And so um, in terms of dimensionality, we want to identify special properties of the problems that we work with so that we can control this curse. So I won't go into the details there. And we want to have better design points so that we can have a faster convergence rate, meaning you have less points, using less points to be able to get to a good result. I want to talk to you about this construction of the points, if I still have enough time, maybe another five minutes or so. So I, this, is, this is really, really cool, I think. Okay. Um, yes, I have some trade secrets to share. So I know that there are some high school people here, and there may be even some first year students. So the rest of you just please like blink your head out. Okay. So the, the trade secret in my research area, right? If you pay attention and um Nathan, my new uh, honor student, pay attention. So the trade secret and what we do is actually quite easy. Okay. The one thing I did most in my analysis of the research and the proof is just averaging. So what does that mean? So I have an error criteria. So this is a quantity which a quantity e which tells me how good a lattice rule generating vector is. The smaller the better. This is like the opposite of the HSC number. You want the smaller the better. Okay. So I want this number to be as small as possible. And this vector has s components. Each component can be any number between zero up to n minus one. Combinatorics tells you that you have altogether n to the power of s such vectors. Okay. So I want to know if there is a good one amongst all of them. How do we check? We average, okay? So we just take the average of this quantity over all such choices, divided by one over, uh, divided by n to the s, because that's how many there are, right? And then we use some analysis to check that this average we computed is good, good in some sense. Let's not get into it, okay? Good means it converges in a good rate and it does not depend on dimension and so on. And so the averaging argument says, if the average is good, then there must be something which is almost as, at least as good as the average. That's it. So if I can prove that the average is good, there must be something that is good. If the average of HSC mark is this, then there must be someone doing better than the average, okay? Better yet, the one person who minimizes the worst criteria, because the minimum is obviously gonna be better than the average. And so this is my way of finding the best one, you can say, except this is what's called an existence result. We know that there exists one, but we don't know how to find it. Why is it an existence result? Well, the minimum, you know, I can find it. Why can't I find it? Because n to the power of s, when s is large, is such a huge number. I don't have the life or to the end of the universe to go and check every single case to see if this one is the minimum. Okay, so even though I know the minimum exists, I don't know how to find it computationally. It could take forever. And so the way we deal with this problem is by trade secret number two, induction. Okay, so you all know this from high school. So what, what you need to do is we just need to do it step by step. So the idea is the error criterion in dimension S plus one, we can write it in terms of the error criterion in dimension S, plus anything else which is affected by the new bit, okay? So this first one depends on only the past and the rest is lumped in there. So now, because I'm dealing with this one component at a time, I only have n possible choices for the new component each time, okay? And so again, I use the averaging argument. I ever, with the previous components fixed, I just average over the new part and then somehow show that the average is good. But this step will come from the induction hypothesis. Those of you who know what mathematical induction is, you know that's the main part. You assume this is good, and then you prove that the next one is also good. And so this not only gives us an existence result saying there must be at least one choice as good as the average, the minimum will be good. And we can now find the minimum because there are only n choices each time to check. We do not have the curse anymore, okay? And that is really what we do. PhD is not that hard, right? <laughs> There's some truth in it. Ask Abby, yeah? That's what we do. She's gonna freak out. She says, no, that's not what you told me. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now, so now when we, 
bear with me, I will try and wrap up. So, okay. So we are talking about computing this error criterion to see how to find a good component of the letter string. And this evaluation, so you, you got to think about, we got to go through the error criteria depends on every point. So there's this index I that needs to go through every point. And then my generating vector component can be chosen in the range zero to N minus one. So this Z in the last component also goes from zero to N minus one. And so basically we have to evaluate the combination of the index I going from zero to N minus one and the component of Z going from zero to N minus one. Because, but because you are computing this multiplication modulo n, whatever you are computing basically has this structure. So every color represents a particular value. So this is what's called a matrix, okay, whatever that is. But you can see this beautiful pattern coming from this i times z mod n. This pattern is beautiful. It's not good for computation because multiplying a general matrix by a vector is n squared operation, if you know what that means. But if we just be clever and just swap some rows and columns around, do some permutation, you can turn this matrix into a slightly boring matrix, but it is what's called circular. It means that you have the same repeated structure along that way. And for a circular matrix, you can multiply them using what's called fast Fourier transform. It just means you can do it very fast. Okay, so instead of n squared, you have the cost, which is n log n, and n log n is almost like n, so if n is 10,000, n squared is a lot bigger, okay? So this really speeds things up. And other things we could do are, we want to have a lattice rule which is extensible, that means you can say that 10,000 points is not enough, I want to now use 20,000. I can just keep all the computations I already have, just compute the new ones to make it extensible. And that means you need to have some nested structure, so this is, some sort of nested structure in powers of two, and you can do all sorts of tricks, and you basically can do things in this fast Fourier transform operations really fast. Okay, um, I will really try to wrap up now. Let me just tell you this one example. So this is, what do we do with these letters rules in the end? How does it really help in the real world? So this is one of the projects that we worked on. Don't worry about the formula so much. This is only to satisfy the, um, academics here. Um, let's just look at the picture. Okay, so this morning I read in the news, I mean, I read on the phone when I was half asleep. There's a, on ABC it says, where is Australia going to bury its nuclear waste from the AUKUS submarine thingy? Okay, so this is actually what they do in the UK and United States. They bury their nuclear waste on the ground. Do you know that? So, so, so some places they have secure sites for burying their nuclear waste. So now imagine this is a thin slice of rock on the ground and you don't know the permeability, but suppose you do. Suppose you know that the dark spot means it's really, really dense. Water cannot sift through. And the light part corresponds to sort of water channels. It's, it's more permeable. So you can imagine if I have water flowing from left to right and there's water blocking above and below. So you have water flowing from left to right. You can imagine that if I put a particle here at this spot, you see the dots in the back? Yeah, okay, so I am not tall enough for that. So if you put a particle here, you can imagine the water will carry it through the channel and then it might just come out here on the other side or it might go there and then it comes down here and might get stuck. Okay, so imagine this, underground, the problem is, and this could be another possible picture. The problem is we are up here, the ground is down there. You cannot know what's the permeability field. So you have to make some guess. So normally what people do is they will make some drillings to get some idea of what it's like. And then they will just look at all the properties and make a guess, make some um, distribution, probability distribution, some assumptions. And then it's a model of the random field. It's random because we don't know what it is. And what we then do is we then try and solve a problem with this randomness. So this omega read later represents a random element. So you can imagine we have to solve a problem with many different random realizations of the underground because we don't know exactly what it is and we just take the average of it. So if you use Monte Carlo method, you are basically generating random images like this, solving the PDE each time and then get the answer. And because all the quantities of interest depends on this randomness, 
it's a high dimensional integration problem. Let's just put it this way. And when we use quasi multi color method, we're trying to generate these random images in a more smart way, in a better than random way, so that you get a faster convergence rate because solving these problems can take a very long time in real life, okay? And so I think I can give you a few more examples, but I think we are done with that. Just, I mean, just end with this very last slide of, this is one of the most recent projects we're working on. This is a, a scattering problem. So you have this butterfly region, which is solid, impenetrable, and then we have wave coming from the right-hand side, and you can see that it comes and it hits this butterfly and then start bouncing off. And so behind the butterfly, so red actually means very low, so there's no waves behind the butterfly. And they are just different pictures representing different aspects of this calculation. I just thought this is a nice picture. And this is a good place to stop before we have our drinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.